So again, thank you for coming to the Conservation Education um, Lunch and Learn. And we're gonna hear from Lindsay Rogers. She's a division administrator of the Fish and Wildlife Education Division at Nebraska Game and Parks. And she's gonna walk through really the, the start to the finish of what planning an education program looks like. Go ahead, Lindsay. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Amber said, my name is Lindsay Rogers. I'm with our Fish and Wildlife Education Division. I've been with the commission for about 12 years now. And um, I started out in the wildlife division for, for most of my career. I was in the wildlife division working as a wildlife educator and um, running a couple of different programs. And um, then in uh, the last couple of years, I've been in our Fish and Wildlife Education Division. So, you know, I'm not going to lie this. Um, this presentation asked me to put what is at this point in my career just intuitive and what we do without even thinking really about it into um, into a um, an actual presentation and to like formally like align how we put together an education programming. And um, it really became evident that it's not necessarily a linear like first you do this and then you do this and then you do this. Um, so I really wanted to take you through all of the considerations that we go through when we are planning a new program. Um, and when I say program, generally speaking, I'm talking about a newer, bigger initiative, not necessarily a one time classroom presentation. Um, although much of what we can um, what much of what we talk about today can be implemented for a one time classroom or library or um, event presentation. Um, but I'm trying to set, um, I'm trying to look a little bit more broad at like if we're going to start a new education program, like, for example, um, I'll talk a little bit about kayak education, because that's something that the Fish and Wildlife Education Division is really starting to look at doing more, more heavily and more stoutly um, in conduct conjunction with other divisions. But, but that's a program. It's not one kayaking program that we do at Homes Lake. It's like the program of um, all of it and what we look at or um, excuse me, we're looking at doing a little bit more urban, like a, a concentrated effort on urban wildlife education. And so that would be the program. Lots of little presentations will happen in there and um, articles and all those different kinds of things will happen within this one program. So I just wanted to clear that up a little bit. Um, so these are kind of some of the considerations that we'll go through. Um, what goes into planning and preparing and, and thinking about starting an educational program? Um, Really, there is, I mean, truthfully, there is a whole that UNESCO, the United Nations has a whole thing on education program planning, like no joke, this is this is something very serious that people take into account because what we are looking at is the education and how we plan education and how we look at educating the next generation. And so this is something that we take um, like um, from a professional level very seriously because it is not just about you know, oh yeah, 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 that'd be good to incorporate. It's it's very professional in the thinking behind it. You know, you go from planning to designing and really putting in some concrete things to developing and really honing in on things. And then you actually do it. And then, you know, ideally, yes, for good practices, you would evaluate. Um, and so this is the process. And there's so much little things that go into each one of these steps that, that we'll talk about here today. Um, some of the things we think about, and, and, and I say some because this is just some, I could go on for, oh my God, I really, at some point, I came back to this slide, my little agenda multiple times, and I was like, okay, well, we don't have time to talk about that, so I'm taking that out, and we got to take that out, and this out, and then I was like, no, we really got to talk about this one, so, so I could go on for hours. These are just some of the things that we need to think about when we're planning new programming, um, and, and the, it's the needs, what do the learners need? Um, what do the learners want? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the demographics of our audience, staff power. So, so we all recognize that we as an agency are limited in our staff and um, um, that is something we need to consider. Our rate of return and then um, a budget. And um, sadly, I, you know, we don't have infinite amounts of money. So what are, what are the budget things that we need to think about? So we'll jump right in and we'll, we'll talk about the needs. Um, so what do learners need to know from more of that society's perspective right so what do we need um or it's really not what we need but what do they need to know right like um we need for example society to know that in north america in um, the united states we drive on the right side of the road right okay so we need people to know that we need from a societal perspective what do we need people to know 
Um, we need people to know that conservation is critical to our natural resources. We need, um, or society needs to know um, that, um, that their natural resources are what help them survive. So some of these basic things that from a societal standpoint, people just need to know. And then really we need to look at things of what we want them to know, right? So we want them to know that they are part of conservation. We want them to know that outdoor recreation helps with your mental health. We want them to know some things, but there's there's a distinct difference between what do people truly need to know and what we need them to know, right? And that gets into the kind of that relevancy of making sure Game and Parks is, is relevant. So we talked about some of those societal standards um, and, and society needing people to know things, but then we can look at things from, for example, a formal education standpoint. And there are um, state educational standards that say, all students in K-12 must, by the time they graduate, they need to know um, X, Y, or Z. They need to know all of these different things. And um, I, this is nerdy of me, but I really enjoy looking at state standards and I'm fascinated at the way they are put together and the way they work and the way they scaffold. And, and really, I think our, at this point, I think our state science standards are awesome and I love looking at them. But again, like I said, we need to also look at what are our agency needs and what do we need people to know to understand what we do. We need people to know that wildlife research is critical. And the more we know about wildlife, the better we know how to conserve wildlife. Um, and if we can be more effective at conserving wildlife, then that will um, not only work to the benefit of um, conserving wildlife, but it will work um, better from an economic standpoint. Um, so we need them to know some basic things. So. <clears throat> talking about wants what do want what do learners want to know and this becomes really really important because we do work fish and wildlife education our agency game and parks commission does do a lot of work with formal education right and so we work with k-12 schools um but that's really not all that we do as an agency and even within fish and wildlife education i think a lot of times people think that fish and wildlife education division works almost exclusively the schools. And that's not actually the case. Actually, I would say um, probably less than 50% of our time is spent in that formal education. But when we talk about formal education, students must be there. They are required literally by law to be in some form of education um, in those K-12 years. So it's, it's important to know that when we are talking about formal education, <laughs> This is going to sound terrible. It is less important of what students want to know and more about what they need to know um, and what they're being required to know. But most of what Game and Parks does, with red, whether it's in Fish and Wildlife Education or Wildlife Division or Fisheries or, or Parks, whatever it happens to be, most of the education that Game and Parks is doing is in the non-formal sector. It's also called free choice learning. And that's the that's a good thing because it reminds us that people can come and go as they please. So if we are not attuned to what learners want to know and the ways learners want to be learning, then they're going to leave. When we talk about free choice learning, we need to be mindful that we are there to serve these this audience, regardless of what the audience is, and then remember that um, we need to be really tuned into what they want and how they want it. Um, and, and plan our programming around that, as opposed to expecting them to want to be there um, and that they'll come no matter what. Um, when it's free choice learning, we are competing with a lot of people with everyone's time and we're competing with a lot of different things, right? So we need to look very closely at the wants. So on that note, um, about a year ago, we did a community survey. The commission's education strategic plan called for us to do a community survey to figure out a little bit better what Nebraskans want for um, education programming. So it focused in on education. And, and I wanna point out, we, we focused this survey very strategically on our underserved audiences. And so we didn't advertise it in our traditional ways. We didn't put it out on Game and Parks um, Facebook page because those those individuals are generally speaking already our users. Um, we didn't send it out in um, newsletters because again those people are are, um, are are already our users. We looked at doing paid social media advertising targeting different audiences. We worked with community partners to be able to spread the survey that way. Um, 
And so what we came out <clears throat> was a ton of information, but one aspect that was interesting to look at is um, rural versus urban. And we can look at rural versus urban in a number of different ways. Um, when we really get down to it, um, if, we, if we look at Nebraska's population, we are at this point about 66% urban um, and 54% of our population. So over half of our population lives in three counties alone, Douglas Sarpy, which is the Omaha area, and then Lancaster, which is Lincoln. So I really divided it up that way. If you look at the USDA, um, they divide um, urban, rural, generally speaking, as about 50,000. Um, in this case, I went with 100,000, which would mean it would be Omaha and Lincoln. When we compare them and we ask them, what education topics are you interested in? A couple things will, should, be, should be noticeable. First and foremost, those non-Omaha Lincoln, those more rural communities, um, a higher, significantly higher percentage of individuals wanted um, fishing and hunting and shooting sports education, right? So it's not just that like it was a little bit higher, it was significantly higher. In for fishing, it was 13% higher, and for hunting, it was 18% higher, right? So it's very clear when we when we start doing that. Um, when we look at more urban populations, those Omaha and Lincoln populations, we can see that 9% more wanted community science, 11% that conservation of natural resources. Um, when we go down to hiking, it was 14%. Um, if we look at my, my, the biggest gap was way over here with wildlife viewing um, or watchable wildlife, that was 29%, nearly 30% higher for urban audiences, right? So if we go into a rural area and we start talking about watchable wildlife, it's probably not going to be a well attended program, to be honest. Um, that's not to say that rural communities are not interested in watching wildlife. They just watch wildlife on a daily basis. If you live in a rural setting, if you are out on a farm or a ranch, you see wildlife every day. You don't necessarily need or want a program to um, focus in on watchable wildlife. You don't, you don't need or want that. But if we start looking at wildlife viewing in an urban setting, then we really start to see that the, the need for actual education programming and the desire to do watchable wildlife programming is significantly higher, and that's where we would be. So um, if we look, and I'll continue that topic of rural to urban, right? If we look at our demographics and that location of our um, our constituent or of the audience, right? Urban residents have a different relationship with wildlife, right? So generally speaking, when we talk about rural, um, they're around wildlife, they are either more accustomed to wildlife or they do have different relationships. And a, a prairie dog is a good example. If you ask most urban residents, um, Omaha or Lincoln residents, do they like prairie dogs? Um, unless they have a direct tie to a farm or they grew up on a farm prior to moving to an urban area, most of the time they'll say they're really cute and they really think they're so super awesome and they love them. If you go to a rural um, area, that's probably not the same response that you're going to get. Urban re residents, um, have different interests in what they want to learn about wildlife. And again, this goes back to that free choice learning and it goes back to understanding our audience's wants as opposed to relying on what they need to know. And then um, it, I, it should be pointed out that it's important to recognize that urban residents have a limited knowledge in general of the role game and parks plays in wildlife conservation. And we understand this because the number of calls that we get um, when we're talking about um, depredation or uh, my neighbor's feeding wildlife or um, I've got an injured baby bird in my backyard and I want you to come save every single baby bird in my backyard. The, the majority of those calls come from urban settings. And so we know that that urban wildlife or urban residents have, have a more limited knowledge of the role game and parks plays in wildlife conservation and also consequently um, the role they themselves play in wildlife conservation. So we need to think about where this program is going to be because that's going to determine what the messaging is that we need to be sending out um so if we look a little bit at demographic um you know if we look at the age for example 
that there is a different program that we would do for early childhood versus adults. You, you really would not do the same program ever for the same audience, right? Um, if we think about it for, for example, um, math, because I'll be honest with you, I think math is a really easy way. At an early childhood, we just want kids to understand that numbers have meaning. The number two means there's two of something, right? Two apples or two trees or whatever it happens to be. Numbers have meaning, right? And then when we start to get into that lower elementary um, and, and even, well, elementary, we'll just say overall elementary, we, we want to learn that numbers can be manipulated. We can add them, we can subtract them, we can divide or multiply them. We can look at them in fractions. Um, we can look at them as percentages, right? So we can start to look at numbers. Um, and then when we get a little bit older, when we're in middle school, we start to recognize that numbers can be organized. Um, numbers can be organized into, for example, percentages or charts and graphs. We can organize numbers in different ways. And then when we really get to an advanced level, like high school, adult, college, we can use numbers to make decisions, right? So we can use all these numbers that we are gathering, all this data that we are gathering to be able to make decisions, whatever that decision is, whatever the topic is, we're using numbers in that way. So this is what we call scaffolding. We, we really need people to get those basic understandings um, before we can get to, uh, we can't jump in and talk about population dynamics, for example, with kindergartners. We just, we can't do that. Um, going into that, um, a good example is, at that early childhood um, kindergarten level, we just want kids to learn that all things have needs, food, water, shelter, space in the proper arrangement. We just want kids to understand that. Um, and then we want them to understand that their needs or animals needs come from habitat. So where do we get our water? Where do we get our food? Where do we get those resources? Um, and then as we progress on, we start talking about that the needs or the lack thereof of the needs are related to the population of an animal. So if we have, um, uh, for example, if we have a drought um, and there's no water, then that's going to relate to the population of whatever species that we're talking about. Um, and then so that progresses on to population dynamics are related to habitats. So we, this is really complex topics that we do a lot of research on really comes back to in an early childhood level, um, all things have needs, right? Everything needs water. Every living thing needs water. Um, I will say that um, there are some messages that are timeless, right? So go outside. I don't care if it's a child or an adult, we want them to go outside. But how we're gonna get them to go outside or the messaging that we are gonna send to get them outside um, is going to be different between early childhood and adult, right? Um, so. Let's see, um, a good example of age and, and what um, things go into the mindset of an educator and thinking about things is an estimation, is a readability index. So as we're developing something new, a new program or, or really more specifically a new resource like Trail Tales or um, we, we do a series called the bird or excuse me, the ology series. So we have birdology, mammalology, reptile and amphibianology. Um, when we look at these, we use oftentimes a readability index and there's a number of readability index I typically go with the flesh Kincaid but Coleman Lau I will also go with. Um, any of these you can type it into an online readability index and it will tell you what age so we're going to practice this for a minute. Here is a. Um, a piece of text and it's long why because readability indexes require 100 words so you can't just do one sentence you got to have a number of words so um over time the rolling grasslands became overrun with cedar trees sharp tail grass like great um greta sorry that's greta and her family left as well as her field as well as her friends the western meadow lark and the american bearing beetle the american bearing beetle is an endangered species found right here in nebraska the beetles help clean up small dead animals by burying them underground and laying their eggs with the carcass. The beetle larvae will grow up feeding on the small animal in their parent that, that their parent buried for them. Burner Bob helps Greta and the ranchers use prescribed fire to restore habitat. Broadleaf plants such as goldenrod, purple prairie clover, and stiff sunflower are some of the many plants that grow well after prescribed by fire. So I'm going to ask you to get out the chat box and tell me what grade level you think this is written at. Is this like kindergarten? Is this third grade? Is this 
college, where do you think that this is written at? Anybody else? Okay, Shauna's our winner today. This is written at the ninth to 11th grade level. Okay, so what we seem to, and, and, I, and I will say this, in my experience at Game and Parks, typically speaking, biologists underestimate. Um, so they would say that this would be um, you know, fifth, sixth grade level, when in actuality, we are talking about um, high school level. Um, this would, if we were producing a publication for the general public, this would be too advanced. Um, we aim for somewhere in the sixth grade range for general public. People laugh at this, but when we do trail tales, um, we aim, trail tales are for fourth graders. Um, typically speaking, when we get an article from a biologist, which are amazing, and we love our biologists for writing these articles, um, because they have the content, like they have the passion for this, the topic, but when we get them in, they're typically written at the, the high school, sometimes college level. And then our job as an educator is to take it and split it up. So things that, that the these reading index looks at is the length of a word, like meadowlark is a really long word. Doesn't mean we can't use it, but if there's more longer words, that's gonna increase your reading level. If the sentences um, have you know a lot of words in them before, you know, we want short, simple sentences to lower the reading level. Um, so we often take that and we will just break up, keep the same meaning, but break it up. But these are the things that we as educators look at in developing new resources or new programs. Let's see. So we also need to look at when we're talking about demographics, something that goes into that or, um, it, or, or when we look at different identities is the past experiences and knowledges. Um, um, so for example, we often do an activity called first impressions. And so um, if we look at these, we need to recognize that everybody has different experiences when they think about a butterfly, for example. Some people will love butterflies. They will think they're amazing. Some people will not like butterflies. They had a terrible experience or they don't like them for some reason. There's something, they're in a frowny face. They don't like it. And then some people are really just ambivalent. I don't love them. I don't hate them. I don't know enough about them. So in the chat box, tell me, are you smiley? Are you, you know, medium or are you frowny when it comes to um, a butterfly? All right, we're gonna do this again. Amber really loves butterflies, really, really loves them. Um, we're gonna do this again. I want you to do the same thing. Enter in, in the chat, your feelings on a spider. I can't tell if those are like, excited and scared right like oh i but think i intrigued. should like it but i don't <laughs> like it mel i would also be there right there i'm just going to be honest with you spiders are my thing spiders are my like i can do this kind of moment um right so everybody comes with different experiences and knowledge and we're going to do one more tell me what you think about a mountain lion All right. <laughs> nice smell, right? Like, I love them, but, <laughs> but I don't really want to hug them. This is a no hugging species, by the way. That's that's how I generally rule things. Like, are we hugging it or are we not hugging it? Um, so one of the biggest things that we need to recognize as educators when we're doing a program, and this often has to do with like when you're on the ground doing it, um, we need to take that into consideration when we're presenting something. 
Um, for example, um, interestingly enough, and this is anecdotal because I, I don't, I, on this particular thing, I don't have hard data on this one, but anecdotally, um, I will say that when we, when I first started at the commission and I was doing a ton of early childhood educator workshops, so I'm educating the teachers of early childhood students, and I would ask them to do this exact activity of, of smiley face, frowny face, or medium face. And I would show a mountain lion. When I first started, um, it was definitely frowny face, like, no, I don't like mountain lions. Um, and then as we as a commission started doing more education and getting more information out there about mountain lions, it really, we saw this shift. I saw over about four years, this shift to smiley face. I had a lot of people, certainly there were still some in the frowny face, but I definitely had more people in the smiley face. Um, category and so so we can watch trends like that we've seen it dip down when we started the hunting season I saw that dip down and then eventually it got back up. But the point in bringing this in is is that not only does this impact you the day of the program when you're actually with people or you're presenting information, but because you know as a professional educator that this will impact your program day of you need to be thinking about this as you plan a program right. People's past experiences and knowledge are gonna play into how this program goes through. So let's talk a little bit about staff power. Um, we know that the commission is limited in our staff. We have only a certain number of biologists. We have a certain number of marketing specialists. We have a certain number of graphics designers. We have a certain number of educators, right? So this is definitely something that I look at more now as an administrator than I did when I was a, um, you know, uh, on the ground educator doing the amazing work. Um, but but we look at how long will it take the staff person to develop a new program, right? So if development phase is going to take five years, we gotta we gotta think about that. Um, or, for example, how many people will be needed to implement a new program? So once we've developed something, we're ready to take it out and go work with people. How many staff people are we going to need to do this program every single time we do a presentation? Um, how long will it take to travel to the program, right? So those are things that we need to consider as we are developing new things. This plays, the staff power plays right into um, rate of return. Okay, so rate of return is how much are we as an agency gaining from this education programming. So can the program be replicated right we're going to spend all this time in development and that's great and I have no problem with doing that because we know that the more time we spend in development, the better the product is going to be right. Um, but then if we're having to put all that time into um a one-time program that we only offer once that's not a high rate of return so we look at programs of how easily can we replicate them or tweak them does that make sense a good example would be the science of series that monica mccubrey is doing um, their weekly webinars um, that she does um, throughout this the year they're always on thursdays the amount of time that it took her to set up the first one was fairly high but then we get a system going down, right? Or another or another example is the first time I did a Project Wild Educator Workshop, oh my God, it took me like two weeks to get this program ready to go and this, this educator workshop and two weeks for a eight hour presentation. Whew, if we did that every time we did an educator workshop, we wouldn't have a high rate of return, but it's okay to put in that two weeks if, the rate of return is going to get better over time. Now, if we wanted, to, if I wanted to go do a Project Wild workshop, I could grab some stuff off the shelf and run with it. I don't need much. I maybe two hours to prep for an eight-hour workshop. So that's how can it be related? How many students are going to be really reached? Right. So am I going to reach two hundred or am I going to reach two? How many students will be reached per staff hour? Right. So if I'm putting in you know, between the development and all of those kinds of things, if we start to look at staff hour time, um, is the program applicable to broad audiences, right? So this is saying, can we replicate it or tweak it to meet the needs or the wants of diverse audiences? And I put an asterisk by that because I, I don't necessarily think that a program is off limits or is not worthy of doing because it can't be applicable to broad audiences. I'm just saying that's something we think about. And then how long until we see the impacts or results, right? So 
I will say that from a fish and wildlife education division, what we are trying to do is increase the ecological knowledge of society as a whole. We want people to be more science literate and more ecologically literate to understand why Game and Parks does what Game and Parks does. We might not see the impacts or the results of what the Fish and Wildlife Education Division is doing for 20 years. It is what it is, right? If we are gonna really invest heavily in early childhood education, which we have um, with our Growing Up Wild program, what that is gonna mean is, is that that child then is going to need to, to be progressed along this, this, this whole hierarchy. And we might not see them be an outdoor enthusiast or a conservationist until they get to be 25. So it's gonna be years before we start seeing that. So thinking about that, that doesn't mean any of these programs are off limits, but we think about that. I think about that when we're developing new programs. Um, is it a one-time program versus an ongoing program? So sometimes we'll get asked to go do a uh, classroom program or classroom presentation. It's a one-time presentation. The students may or may not have learned something before. They may or may not be learning something after it. Sometimes it feels like we're just there for entertainment. The value of that versus the value of students in a classroom being part of the Trout in the Classroom program where every day they're looking at water quality every day they're contemplating the growth of their trout and the impacts of trout or the impacts of water quality on trout growth or temperature and all of these different things clearly trout in the classroom is going to have a greater impact for that classroom than a one-time presentation would um, we need to think about total impact versus immediate impact so for example a project wild workshop might have 20 students which is educators we teach educators but then if we think about that, the 20 educators that we train might go back and teach 20 students in each of their classroom. So the total impact is significantly bigger than the immediate impact. Budget. So what do we think about when we talk about budget? This is again, something sadly, I think about significantly more now than I did before. Um, when we look at budget, some of the things that go into a, the budget when we talk about education are staff, the equipment, the travel, and then the professional development to make sure that our staff are top notch. When we look at the budget, staff is by far the biggest, biggest um, one chunk of our budget. Why? Because to do quality education, it really comes down to having quality professional educators, and, and that's what we invest most of our money in. Um, the equipment is fairly small, the travel is fairly small, the professional development, all of those things gathered together and a bunch of other things come up with um, the, the rest, the other half of it, right? When we think of the budget, I think about staff hours. So the science of webinars, Monica McCubrey does them, she does all the prep for it. Um, generally speaking, if we have a big audience, which we are fortunate to have had, um, we'll get somebody to come in the day of the program, the one hour of the program and help moderate it. But in general speaking, it's it's one person that's running these, they've been highly effective versus a kayaking program. Um, when we look at a kayaking program, when we actually go do the program, we may need three or four staff people to go out and run that program. When we look at what equipment is needed for science of, it's a computer that, that the Monica already has, right? Um, versus a kayaking program, we need a trailer, we need kayaks, we need PFDs, we need safety equipment, we need all of that kind of stuff. So looking at the, the value of programs based off the budget, um, a one-time presentation running into a classroom or a library to do a one-time presentation versus a community science program, there's a cost. There's a difference in the cost of that program. That said, we want kayaking programs. We absolutely need community science programs, right? These have huge value that goes back to the return on investment. That kayaking program um, has huge return on investment. Community science has um, huge return on investment. So it's just weighing all of these different things. And then there's all this other stuff that we take into consideration. So as we are looking to develop a new program or a one time kind of thing, we look at what are our desired outcomes? What do we want at the end of the day from this program? What do we want? Do we require registration or no registration? Who's our audience for this program? Um, you know, is what age are they? What um, 
oh, what skill level are they? Um, what um, language do they speak? Where are they located? And we got to think about the location of the program. Do we want to go into the community to do it? Do we want to be doing it virtually versus in person? Do we want to be doing it at a state park or state rec area? Do we need to bring in presenters? What format do we need to be doing this in, right? So do we, is this a completely hands-on kind of thing? Is this a self-guided thing? Um, we got to do marketing and promotion of it. Um, there's so many things that go into developing all of these things. So if we put it all together, from my perspective, this is what I start to look at. I start to look at, and this is only, I will say this, this is only for fish and wildlife education. I look at early childhood and say, okay, what are we doing? As one aspect of what we are trying to do is um, look at age and make sure that we are covering this, this spectrum of birth to death, right? Um, so what are we doing to meet the needs of early childhood or the, the wants of early childhood? What are we doing to meet the wants of elementary or middle school or young adult and seniors? If we had only one thing in one of these columns, we would have a problem. And I will be brutally honest with you. Um, Ten years ago, we had a lot of stuff in the early childhood and elementary. We kind of had some stuff in middle school and high school, but it was weak at best. And for young adults and adults, um, we, we just didn't have a whole lot, right? Now we can see that as we have grown education, we have diversified the types or the age levels that we are trying to reach. And that didn't come by chance. This came by critically thinking whose needs or whose wants are we not meeting. When we look at virtual versus in-person versus self-guided versus resource development, Again, we have all of these different things and, and you'll notice, for example, growing up wild is in virtual and in person. Why? Because we'll do them in both formats, right? Um, but when we look at Project Beak, for example, that's not something that we typically do an in-person program for or even a virtual program. That's a self-guided website that people can go to themselves. Um, when we talk about resources, that would be like Trail Tales or our our ology book series or online lesson plans. Um, so some of those resources that we are providing to people to then take and use other places. And then if we start to look at the budget side of things, what are our low cost, our medium cost and our high cost things? If everything was in the high cost column, we'd have an issue. But oftentimes with those high cost things, we get a better rate of return. Does that make sense? And so we want to manage this and recognize that Trout in the Classroom takes a lot of our staff time, not necessarily money, cash, but it takes a lot of staff time, which in the end is a cost, right? Um, and so if we look at Trout in the Classroom, it, it takes a lot of Grace's time to do this. There's a lot of travel involved, you know, but the rate of investment is high versus science of webinar series, the, the cost is relatively low, but we're getting a pretty good rate of return because we're seeing so many people participate. And, and it's really a matter of looking at um, cost per staff hour, I guess. That is, you know, I, I hope that that's what you are hoping for. I hope that that gave you a better understanding of what we think about when we develop a new program or when we're thinking about developing a new program you know is it needed is it wanted is the biggest thing is it wanted by the public and then what are all of those different constraints or considerations that need to go into it what questions do you guys have yeah i think that was great and i really appreciated it, it was almost like a high level of looking at program development um, especially maybe meeting an organization's mission level, not mm -hmm. just how to put one program together. Yeah. In the classroom, I, but I really like that approach of like kind of the, that top down 30,000 foot um, view because that's also equally important. And often I feel like in some of the PD I've seen or the professional development I've seen, that kind of stuff is uh, not as salient. So that was really great. Thanks right. Sharing that. Thank, yeah. I think. Um we could do a whole nother program on how to plan. A, and, and I've given that presentation of how do you start doing yeah. a program and what questions do you need to be asking and what considerations. And that was kind of my all the other stuff slide is mm -hmm. all that stuff goes into it. But but for this one, I really wanted to look at that big picture. 
Oh, that's great. Do we have any questions from our participants today? Is there anything that you heard today that uh, is gonna maybe be helpful or useful um, or you will think about differently? No, but I'm curious what you all have planned next. Um, kayaking programming is a big one. Um, it is um, a, um, we, we've invested a lot of money because kayaks aren't cheap and trailers aren't cheap. And quite honestly, our plan was to get it going last summer, but then there was these little things called supply chain issues and trailers and, um, and all of that um, was an issue. But we finally got the last trailer in yesterday, operations and constructions are putting everything together. So kayaking education and really utilizing kayaking not just for outdoor recreation, but as a means to teach ecological education. So when you're out on the kayak, mm -hmm. let's take some water quality samples. Let's look at what fish are around and what aquatic plants are around. Let's go birding by kayak. So melding the two, melding the science and the outdoor recreation together. Um, and then another big one is, um, as I mentioned, was urban wildlife education and really investing heavily in that. And we're I think we're kind of going slow on that one because we want to do it right and we want to take in and that's something that will impact every division in this agency and so really thinking critically of how do we do that. To meet the agency's needs, not just me I, I want to go teach more kids in urban areas, but how is that going to meet our agency's needs um, and then Community science, I would say, is another big one that we are investing in. I mean, certainly we've got some community science programs going, but having Allie Mays on staff um, to be our community science coordinator and really for the agency, regardless of division, hone in and coordinate community science efforts to make sure that we are being strategic and coordinated in the way that we go about doing community science is, um, I think, going to be a big impact. Hey, Mel asked what Project Beak was, and I linked to it, but I wondered if you would like to answer it because you helped create that. Yeah, so this is, goes yeah. back um, like 14 years ago, we made Project Beak. The cool thing is, is that it looks a little outdated and I'm not gonna lie, I know that, um, but really it's still relevant. Um, we, we probably, it's text heavy, I'm gonna, anyway, long story short is, it's a website. It's a website um, and and I noticed on the, um, it's, it's what I would call a low cost now, but in the inner, like when it was first developed, it was like 250, it was like a quarter of a million dollars to develop this website because we paid people to do like interactive things and you know, your mouse would move the bird and all these kind of cool stuffs. Um, but it's a website that focuses in on birds and adaptations of birds and the relationship between birds and people, but it does it from a Nebraska perspective. Interestingly enough, if somebody clicks on um, contact us, it comes to me still because I was the one way back in the day when we were making this and um, we, we the majority of contact um, the majority of questions I get are from um, out of state and significant number from out of country, so the content oh. is relevant, we tried to make it um, every example is Nebraska specific, but it's relevant to broad our audiences, which is um, a, a good way to go about doing education. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you again so much, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, as a reminder, I'll be sending out an evaluation. And then, um, Lindsay, you mentioned some cool resources, that Readability Index. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely share that link um, in our, my follow-up email probably tomorrow. Um, I'll be honest it, with you, how I get to it every time is I just go to Google and type in Readability Index. I tried doing that, but I want to make sure it's the right one. So I'll talk oh, to you and make sure. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yep. But um, I'll, I'll share that and then any other uh, resources she might have mentioned. Um, yeah, okay. That's all. So thanks again and have a great day, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Bye.